Beginning in 2018, AOTA and the American Physical Therapy Association jointly commissioned a research study called the Therapy Outcomes in Post-Acute Care Setting Study, which we refer to as the TOP study. The study was jointly commissioned by Dobson, Devanzo, and Associates to examine which patients are served, therapy intensity, and functional outcomes among Medicare patients in skilled nursing facilities, home health, and inpatient rehabilitation facilities. The study used claims and assessment data from the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services from the years 2015 and 2016. Dobson, Devanzo, and Associates ran the top study data analysis and issued a report. In consultation with an expert advisory group appointed by AOTA and APTA, Natalie Leland and Tracy M. Rose were part of the AOTA advisory group for the top study. This labor and resource intensive collaboration across the Occupational Therapy and Physical Therapy National Associations represents an incredible opportunity as it sought to research and identify the value of therapy discipline and key patient outcomes in home health, skilled nursing facility, and inpatient rehabilitation facility care. As we begin this conversation, I'm gonna start with you, Sharmila. As the VP of Regulatory Affairs, why was it important for AOTA to be involved in the top study? Sure, thanks, Chelsea. So AOTA had both policy and practice reasons for engaging in this study. When we began exploring a study with the American Physical Therapy Association, we saw that there was significant payment reform in post-acute care settings on the horizon at that time. This included the patient-driven payment model, or PDPM and SNFs, and the patient-driven groupings model, um, which was payment reform in home health agencies. At the same time, a unified post-acute care payment model process was underway with CMS and in the development phase. We saw that there was a need for evidence about who was getting therapy in each setting, how those patients are similar, and how they are different to ensure that the voice of our patients and providers are represented in these evolving payment policy initiatives. AOTA also wanted to contribute to the research to better understand the patient needs and outcomes within these three critical settings inpatient rehab facilities, skilled nursing facilities, and home health agencies. We wanted to understand all of these things in the context of payment policy changes that appeared to be devaluing therapy services and were concerning for AOTA and APTA. The top study was conducted over approximately two years and examined 1.4 million Medicare post-acute care stays where occupational therapy and physical therapy services were provided following all acute care hospitalizations in 2015 and 2016. And Natalie, can you share what some of the key questions you and the team asked Dobson, Devanzo, and Associates to analyze the study? From a big picture perspective, we were really interested in understanding the service intensity and outcomes for patients admitted from an acute care hospital uh, to one of these three post-acute care settings. In particular, we were really interested in understanding function and hospital readmissions as our two outcomes. Because we studied or used data from 2015 and 2016, the Medicare claims and the assessment data we used did not capture Section GG as that was not implemented across all settings. So Dobson and Devanzo and Associates had created a cross-setting functional outcomes variable in order to be able to look at change in function across settings. For the study, we didn't look at the second or third PACS days that may occur. We know from the literature that oftentimes there is a series of post-acute care settings that are used during that episode of care after that acute stay. But for this study, we did just focus on that first setting. And as I mentioned, um, we needed to create a cross-setting functional measure because Section GG was not implemented um, yet across settings for the two years that we used. And while there is substantial evidence that documents Medicare beneficiaries do use the multiple PAC settings during that episode, as I just mentioned, we really did want to understand that first post-acute care setting before we got into more complex research questions as you start looking across an entire episode. 
And in terms of the readmissions to acute care, we really wanted to understand readmissions that occurred within that 30 days of discharge from the skilled nursing facility, the home health association or the inpatient rehab facility. And our outcome measure, 30-day hospital readmissions, did capture those going back to an acute care hospital only. We wanted to use the same calculation across all settings, and we wanted to be able to measure from PAC discharge rather than from the acute care discharge. And Tracy, when looking at people who get therapy in home health, a skilled nursing facility, and an inpatient rehabilitation facility, Were there any differences that stood out? The first thing that really stood out to us is how complex the patients are that occupational therapy and physical therapy work with in these post-acute care settings. Um, One of the things that was quite notable was the high rate of depression and dementia among post-acute care patients overall. But there were some differences by setting. For example, almost a third of home health patients had a diagnosis of dementia, and this is quite a bit smaller than the nearly half of skilled nursing facility and inpatient rehab facility patients that had depression. Skilled nursing facilities also served the highest percentage of patients who had dementia. So about 45% of skilled nursing facility patients had a diagnosis of dementia, and this compared to less um, than a third of patients at inpatient rehab facilities with dementia and about a fifth of patients at home health that had dementia. We also saw some uh, significant differences in the ages of patients. So skilled nursing facilities served a greater percentage of patients uh, who are over 85 years of age. And home health agencies served more patients who were in that younger Medicare age, so that's 65 to 74. And inpatient rehab facilities seem to serve kind of more the highest percentage of patients right in that middle between 75 and 85. So what we're seeing on average here is differences in, in age of population served. We also saw differences by primary diagnosis. So about half of patients with stroke are receiving care in an inpatient rehab facility, whereas almost half of patients with congestive heart failure are receiving care in a skilled nursing facility. And almost two-thirds of patients who have a lower extremity joint replacement are receiving care from a home health agency. So with these differences by age group that we see and by diagnosis, it's perhaps not so surprising that we're also going to see differences in the functional status of patients at admission to the different post-acute care settings. So patients who go to inpatient rehab facility for their post-acute care, they tend to have the most functional impairment. Whereas patients who have home health for their post-acute care, they tend to be the least functionally impaired. So they're more independent. And patients who go to SNF uh, skilled nursing facilities for their rehab, they tend to be right in the middle in terms of their functional status. So Taking all of these findings together, what the top study really shows us is how different the patient populations are within, you know, across these different settings. And that's the major reason why the study didn't look across all settings. And and these results also really point to the fact that creating a site-neutral payment system that's fair would be really challenging. What did the study find about the relationship between intensity of therapy services and outcomes? there was a positive association between therapy intensities and functional status. So generally, more therapy was related to an improved ability to perform everyday functional activities. The study also found that patients who received the least amount of therapy were at highest risk for readmission across all settings. So this is really important because readmissions is a critical measure uh, that has implications for quality of care, and it's used by CMS in its quality reporting programs. Um, It's used in skilled nursing facility value-based purchasing. It's used in a lot of different ways that really gets at the uh, care provided in post-acute care settings. So um, that's a really critical finding. We saw that these differences in readmission rates were particularly striking for inpatient rehab facilities and skilled nursing facility patients. So just to give you some numbers here, patients who had the lowest amounts of therapy in skilled nursing facilities had a readmission rate of about 26%. Well, this compared to only about 18% readmission rates for patients who received a medium amount of therapy and only about 15% of patients who received the highest amounts of therapy. So a really large drop in the readmission rates depending on how much therapy you got. In inpatient rehab facility patients, uh, we see a similar striking difference between readmission rates for the lowest therapy group in which nearly 30% of patients had uh, hospital readmissions compared to only 14% or under 14% of patients who had medium and high amounts of therapy. 
So we're really seeing that these higher amounts of therapy are associated with better readmission rates compared to the patients who are getting the least amount of therapy. Dobson, Devanzo, and Associates also did some subgroup analyses to look at these relationships for specific diagnoses. Um, and the findings were quite similar. So it really suggested that this importance of therapy cut across different types of patients, regardless of medical and surgical diagnoses. And did the study differentiate therapy that was provided by occupational therapists and occupational therapy assistants? So yes, um, in this data, we were able to capture the therapy that was provided by occupational therapists, occupational therapy assistants, physical therapists, and physical therapy assistants. Any of those disciplines that provided services to the patient were captured through the minutes reported to Medicare, which is very important for us as a profession because all four of these groups of professionals are pivotal to delivering patient-centered care. And Natalie, our podcast listeners are mostly OTs, OTAs, and students. What are some of the key things that they should take away from this study? One of the skills I think is growing in importance for all of our clinicians is to be able to look at the care that each of us provide and think about not just the patient in front of us, but across all of the patients that we work with. Um, What are we delivering in terms of best practices to the entire population of patients, whether that be for a given diagnosis or a series of symptoms, we are being challenged to really think at that population level to make sure that we are delivering the best practice consistently across all um, similar patients. I think we need to be able to understand as clinicians the patterns of care that we are delivering. And to what extent, I think we need to ask ourselves, are we addressing depression, assessing if there are cognitive impairments and there are cognitive needs that we need to address during our episode of care? And what are some of the risk factors that our patients may have that may result in a failed care transition? How can we proactively identify these care needs and incorporate compensatory strategies um, or interventions into our plan of care to make sure that we are doing our best to limit their risk of readmissions and other poor outcomes. So I think we need to think beyond the pure ADLs, but really think broadly to think about the risk factors that are important for ensuring that safe transition back to the community. And thinking about that discharge environment, um, how do we have discussions and proactively help our patients and caregivers think about the environment and some of the challenges they may face? I think in terms of students, um, I have a similar message to really um, have the opportunity to learn about and understand the evolving um, payment policies that are happening in the U.S. Providing students with the opportunity to understand health system outcomes. How do students um, get introduced to this idea and is that integrated into academic programs? I would also encourage faculty and students to think about that broader focus of the care plan. How do we identify risk factors and areas that need intervention to ensure that our patients go home and stay home? Having them think about the constellation of individuals that are the patient support system. And finally, I'd recommend for students and faculty to look at care delivery at both the patient and population level. That is a perspective shift. So the more opportunities we can build into our curriculum to have students look at occupational therapy care delivery at both a patient and a population level, we're gonna better equip the next generation of occupational therapy leaders um, to understand that interplay between policy practice and the discrete actions that they may provide to their individual patients. And Tracy, what about you? What are some of the key takeaways from this study? I'm going to address this from the perspective of researchers. And I'm going to start by giving the standard answer for any study and that more research is needed. Um, But I'll share some more specifics for your listeners as well. So additional research um, on the relationship between that therapy intensity and outcomes is one of the key next steps. 
Because while this study did find some strong evidence that patients who received the lowest amounts of therapy had the worst functional outcomes and higher rates of readmissions than patients who received more therapy, there's not a clear linear gradual relationship between that increased therapy provision and better patient outcomes. It's also possible that there are some patients out there who require really high intensity therapy to achieve outcomes similar to some patients who may do well with more moderate intensity therapy. So we need some more work in this area, um, particularly with respect to understanding how therapy can benefit patients whose goals are to maintain function or slow decline of function rather than improve their function during their post-acute care stay. In addition, uh, given the changes to the payment systems, given that they don't incentivize therapy provision anymore for reimbursement, it's also going to be important to study how resulting changes in therapy provision due to these payment changes then impact patient outcomes. Based on some additional research uh, that Natalie and I have been leading outside of this top study, we've actually have some preliminary results that show that after implementation of the patient-driven payment model for skilled nursing facilities, total therapy staffing for these patients declined by almost 15% in the first six months. So when you look then at the results of the top study, we know that we're going to see some changes in what therapy provision looks like after these new payment systems are there. So that will be a critical area of uh, future research. Another thing to think about is the top study looked at overall therapy minutes, but future research will also want to look a little more closely at the discipline of the therapy for specific patients, um, different types of therapy interventions that we provide. So looking at total minutes doesn't distinguish between exactly what's happening in those therapy sessions. So is it self-care training? Is it therapeutic exercise? Is it neuro re-education? Um, and we'll also want to look at things like the differences between individual one-on-one -on -one therapy and group and concurrent therapy. So finally, I think one other area that um, I imagine future researchers and other stakeholders of interest will want to be looking at is what happens with patients who have post-acute care at more than one setting. So the top study looked at the first post-acute care setting only. So we'll need to start thinking about those patients that have these more complicated post-acute care trajectories and receive care from more than one post-acute care provider. Great. Thank you, Tracy. And Sharmila, let's end with you. What can practitioners take away from this study and how can they support AOTA in its future effort to address clinical care, quality, and payment in PAC settings? I, I think I would direct this comment at, at our members, of, as you said, and, and the profession at large, but um, really with the focus on those that are doing policy advocacy and even self-advocacy for themselves within their workplace. As Tracy noted earlier, the, the top study results suggest that creating fair site-neutral payments could be extremely challenging, yet that is just what CMS is doing right now um, with a panel of expert clinicians, one of whom is Natalie Leland. Um, they are examining whether these PAC settings should be paid the same regardless of the setting for the care that's provided in the, each of those settings that we've been talking about. AOTA and APTA will be sharing the study with members of Congress, CMS, um, MedPAC, which is an advisory commission on the Medicare program, and other policymakers to emphasize that any approach to payment reform needs to be carefully considered. Really think about the unique patient characteristics, diagnoses, and other care factors that have been discussed today and that are important in PAC settings before adopting an entirely new payment model. Policy advocates can also share this top study with their employers and their facilities. We encourage the profession to utilize the top study to advocate for themselves, as well as with their insurance payers and policymakers, and to share the link that AOTA has provided you that has more information, including a detailed study summary with the specifics of the findings that Tracy and Natalie just talked about, as well as a chart book, a series of PowerPoint slides and slides that have clear data and graphics demonstrating these findings. We feel AOTA and our policy team that really assuring medically necessary therapy that respects the clinical judgment of therapy professionals in these post-acute care settings will be more important than ever as we emerge from COVID-19 and face a new quote unquote normal in healthcare.
To learn more about the top study and to view the study summary and chart book, visit aota.org slash tops. Thank you, Sharmila Sandhu, Natalie Leland, and Tracy M. Rose for speaking with me today and for everything you've done and continue to do for the profession of occupational therapy. My name is Chelsea Rossborough with AOTA.